panel number three. So the final panel today, but not the final event, because we've got a keynote after this. But the final panel today is about politics and partnerships. Politics in this country is already tough and polarized, perhaps you haven't noticed, with regional divisions aplenty. Will a movement away from fossil fuels and toward cleaner energy exacerbate these tensions? Well, you heard some of that in the previous panel. I think you will probably hear more in this panel. How will we build better partnerships with Indigenous people to allow us to develop the major infrastructure projects we will need? And how will we resolve the federal-provincial tensions in all of this? And you may have noticed that um, there seems to be no time that we don't have federal-provincial tensions in this country. The topic changes. The tension seems to remain. So those are the issues that we're going to be talking about uh, for the next 90 minutes. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mel Cap. So he's got many... Um, He's got many bullet points on my piece of paper here. At the top of the list, he's the professor at the Mel Cap School of Public Policy. Oh, sorry, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Monk School of Public Policy um, <clears throat> at the University of... <clears throat> um, uh, but before that, he was the High Commissioner, Canada's High Commissioner to the UK. He was the president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy, just down the road. He was the clerk of the Privy Council federally. He was a deputy minister of environment. He might have been some other things that just aren't on my bulleted list. He's an all-round good guy and, of course, crucially, an eco-fiscal commissioner. So, Mel Cap, take it away. Thanks, Chris, I think. Um, <laughs> let me introduce, we've got a great panel. Uh, let me introduce my co-panelists here. Uh, Rachel Doran, to my left, is the director of policy and strategy at Clean Energy Canada. She um, has a background in policy, politics, and law. Uh, she was policy advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau. She had a number of nonpartisan uh, roles in the Ontario and in the federal government, and um, is an all-around good person. So there you go. Um, the next uh, ca candidate uh, for panel is uh, J.P. Gladieu also an all-around good person. Uh, we, we don't know yet, we'll see. Uh, but uh, JP is an indigenous business leader, and um, I think there's a lot of business in his indigenous leadership, uh, and that is he's on the board of a number of major uh, organizations like Suncor, the Institute of Corporate Directors, Broden Mining, and uh, the First Nations Major Projects Coalition Advisory Center. Uh, and previously, he's been on a number of other Aboriginal uh, business groups. And he was chancellor of St. Paul's University College at Waterloo. So he has a university connection. Uh, and he's on BHP's International Forum on Corporate Responsibility uh, Committee, which he's just back from a meeting on from Singapore. So if he's a little blurry-eyed, we'll be forgiving. I've already said you're a good guy, so I'll go on to Tony Keller, Not a good who's a, <laughs> an even better guy. Uh, even better, huh? Even I, better. I heard, I heard. Um, Tony is a columnist with uh, the Globe and Mail, and we won't hold that against him. He used to be uh, an editorialist uh, with the Globe and Mail and has been editor of the Financial Post magazine, managing editor of McLean's, and a news anchor at BNN. And uh, although he started University at McGill. He ended up uh, graduating from two U.S. universities, yeah. and we won't hold that against you from the University of Toronto either. Um, so let me start uh, by throwing a lob out to each of you, and uh, let me start with Tony. Um, what, uh, what do we need in partnerships and in politics in Canada? 25 words or less. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, he used to, a guy used to say 800 words or less. 800 so. words or less. That was my, that's, that's been my job for a long time. Uh, so I think we have to try to find a way to have the politics and the economics be lined up, to have the, the economically, logically, logical policy for Canada line up with what is 
politically possible, politically viable for Canada, and there are points of intersection and points of whatever the opposite of intersect, whatever the antonym of intersection is, uh, <laughs> points of non-congruence there. Um, so I think, yeah, in 25 words or less, I think that's, that's our challenge on environment and economy. Great, and uh, Rachel, same question. Well, if your question is where are we, um, the answer is we're far from where we need to be. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe the solution of how do we get there, I actually, in 25 words or less, I would go exactly where Tony is. How do we make this something that is, we talked in the last panel about depoliticizing the energy transition, the clean economy. How do we make this something that's an argument on things like jobs, GDP, things that are not polarizing in the same way across this country? And that's a big question I'm sure we'll be digging into. Um, but you know that's how I think we get productive partnerships with indigenous communities, with you know uh, cross partisan politics, um, with industry talking to academia. Um, so I think we're far from all of that, but I think that you know there's a path, there's a good argument. JP, what um, are the politics and partnerships we need? Well, Kelsey Prees, you're going to hear a lot from me on indigenous issues. Um, parity. Parity politically, parity economically, parity when it comes to um, everything ESG. Um, I think uh, Canada has a, uh, still not woken up to the fact that uh, Indigenous communities have a lot of rights and a lot of strength in this country and stuff is not going to get done without us. So the more empowered we are working with the various governments and institutions, the stronger the outcomes and the quicker and more efficient and more certain the outcomes. Um. Jennifer, or Jennifer, uh, Rachel, I want to come back to something you said, and you said we need to talk about uh, jobs and growth and all the things that are not polarizing. Why is the transition polarizing? I was saying to someone uh, just in conversation that, you know, if I uh, said, you know, how do you stand, where's your stance on the oil sands? What's your stance on nuclear energy? What's your stance on windmills? In some ways, you'd find in Canada, historically, that's been a bit of a proxy for where you sit across the political spectrum. Like, energy goes deep to the heart and identity in many ways of how people feel. I think that is changing, and I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening. People mentioned the IRA and just investments going into states that have been traditionally red states in the US and farmers who used to you know, do cattle farming seeing the economic possibilities of having windmills on their property. Texas is now the leading renewable energy state in the United States of America. So you know, how do we kind of see that what used to be a very um, identity-based almost energy politics into seeing that kind of a different way the world has really changed and what those technologies cost and how we use them. How do we change the politics behind how people feel about that? So we talk, this conference is about energy transition and the word environment never seems to come up. Is that like deliberate that we're trying to avoid conflict by not talking about environment? If that was for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, to some degree, Yes. I mean, if you think about Canadian politics, pocketbook issues always come number one across the spectrum of things people tend to care about. Climate goes up and down a little bit. There's other things that come in and out. Um, so I think, you know, speaking to the things that are at the heart of people's daily concerns, can they feed their families? Where is their jobs going to come? You know, that's an important component of it. I mean, I think. Uh, you know, my personal views are, of course, like there's an environmental factor here. There is a moral imperative. We live in a swiftly closing window to secure a sustainable and livable future on this planet, according to the IPCC. Um, you know, there's an environmental aspect to that, but even just what you conceive of as environment needs to change a bit too. So, you know, if you're talking about environment, people typically thought about localized kind of impacts, things that you can see. Are we cutting down trees? Are we digging big holes? To address the climate problem, we're going to need to build a lot of infrastructure and elect transmission lines and mine critical minerals. Like It's a bit of a change in the paradigm. So I guess I would just say, I think all those things are implicated, but how we think about them and how they're interconnected um, is, is a way we need to just shift our an evolution of our thinking. So Tony, th let's push on this a little bit. You said that we need to change the framing of this issue and uh, 
uh, Rachel has just addressed that in part, but uh, who's going to change it? I mean, who, who's, who's the guy in charge of the narrative? Yeah. I mean, you used to be, but... Yeah, no, but it's a good point because there's, cause there's sort of no one fully in charge of the narrative. There are various, you know, various governments, levels of government and competing political interests trying to um, trying to, 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 to dominate the narrative, and, and, and there's a, you know, there's a, there are various arguments taking place in various spaces. I think that the challenge is that, like, so, you know, if you build a sort of simple economic model, you, that, that economic model will sometimes assume sort of uh, perfectly rational actors with perfect information. And, of course, nobody acting in the political process, none of our voters, none of us are perfectly rational actors with perfect information, and there's, there's on both left, right, and everywhere in between, there are some levels of people acting on gut or sort of using tropes. And that on, on the right, that can just be like, we have to preserve oil because, because oil. And on the left, I mean, I'll give you a classic example, but, but these people used this because they knew it would have resonance with certain voters. So a few months ago uh, in Toronto, they decided as part of building the Ontario line subway line, they were gonna cut down about 80 old, very old trees in front of Osgood Hall. And in every newspaper story, there were quotes from people saying, don't they understand that we have to reduce carbon emissions and trees are part of the solution. You can't cut down any old trees. And it's like, there's a very good reason to not cut down those trees. That's not one of the reasons, but it resonates with certain people in the gut. So again, I'm saying there, both on the left, on the right, and in between, there are people with lack of perfect information, lack of full knowledge, and they react reflexively. So um, I was hoping we were going to talk about political leadership, but we'll come back to that. Eh. JP, <laughs> you, you, you talked about uh, it's not going to happen without us. Who is us? Well, us is firstly not a monolith. And we were talking a little bit about that. We do have varying degrees and views like any society. It's interesting what uh, the media will portray us as. Um, actually, the, the Globe does a great job, actually. Um, well, they do. They do. Yeah, they actually tell good. really great stories. Um, and, and most Canadians would think that we're opposed to resource development as Indigenous people. Yeah. Um, and there's a really great, um, you can go to the Indigenous Resource Network. There was a really great environment or a very credible national organization, um, polling firm, um, you know, if you believe in science, then you'll believe in, in the stats, that actually 65% of indigenous people in the rural areas um, strongly support resource development, 65%. That probably goes against your narrative in your head where you think who we are as indigenous people and our stance. It's not to say that we're going to do development for the sake of development. We're not going to do development the way it's been done in the past where you come and you mine our backyards, you leave us with nothing but a mess and we got no benefit out of it. Um, so the us part is the actual indigenous people that are on the ground, um, the ones that are um, you know, living and breathing um, natural resource development, energy transition across this country. There's a saying that's, that's emerged from the First Nations Major Projects Coalition Conference from last year, all paths to net zero lead to traditional territories of our communities. We have rights, constitutionally protected rights. We've got massive court case wins. You're not going to get any through, anything through anymore without our people. And we can talk more about what types of things need to happen, but we're not opposed to energy trends. We want to see it. It just fits more innately with, with our people. But when, uh, you know, Jim did a great job this morning talking about the stats and 5%. And Jim and I had a really quick conversation in the back room. And I said, Jim, do you know that actually 28% of our people rely on oil and gas and mining um, for jobs and economy? So um, there is a narrative out there that needs to be more clearly defined and understood. Um, and I think when we start to, you know, back to your first question, and I think if we can better understand what that narrative is, I think we're going to, and we fight, though, let me tell you, we fight, we fight a lot. And you know, Michael and I have been friends for a while now, and he, he sees all the stuff that we do. Um, Rachel and I have been in similar circles. We fight, and that's okay. Well, so, but, but this is interesting because I'm about to ask you what are the strengths we have in collaboration. But before we get there, pick up uh, both you and, and Tony, JP, had, uh, had talked about the narrative is, uh, is there an, a First Nations or a, an Indigenous narrative that would be helpful to deal with Rachel trying to square the circle between energy and environment? 
So ESG, if anybody tells you they're an ESG expert, run for the hills because nobody in this country is an ESG expert. But don't forget that there is an I in the ESG, the indigenous component of it. Now, I, we, there's a debate amongst my indigenous colleagues. I, I don't believe in putting I off to its, to the side. I just had this piece um, a few weeks ago on their, the ESG plus the I. There is an I in environment, there's an I in social, and there's an I in governance. From an environmental perspective, who else would you want caring for the, the ground than the, the original people that have been on the land for 10,000 years that know the land? I'm a, I know I don't look like much one, but I am a hunter, a fisher. I live on my reserve. I constantly am on the land when I'm not traveling to places like you, you Singapore. You told us you're two hours north of Thunder, Thunder Bay. Bay. So when I land in Thunder Bay, I still have a two-hour drive to get to my house where I live. Um, so having indigenous oversight and environment is really important. Social, when you manage for the lowest common denominator, unfortunately many of our communities in this country, it is the indigenous community. And if you can target the social, stronger outcomes for indigenous, socioeconomic outcomes for indigenous communities, you're probably going to lift up a lot of boats. And from a governance perspective, I used to chair this really amazing Mikasu group of companies, which is an Alberta-based, um, did a lot of work in oil site services, but all sorts of other work. They were doing a billion dollars a year in revenue. Um, and their shareholder was the community, not, you know, we can all be a shareholder of Suncor, and I hope you are. Um, but the, commun the community shareholder is the community, and we think seven generational thinking, not the next quarter. So that's really important. If we put eye off to the side, what typically happens is it gets ghettoized. It, it doesn't get the political or the financial resources to actually do anything good. So when JP and I had a Zoom call interrupted by the bad connection on his First Nation uh, the, uh, reserve, the... That was uh, Elon Musk, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, it was, I thought it, it was the RCMP. But anyway, uh, it, we, I, I told JP that he wasn't to be the token Indian on the panel. So uh, now let me turn to Tony to ask the same question. Uh, is there an indigenous narrative that we should be using more elaborately to explain to the public what energy transition is? That's an interesting question. And, and I gotta be honest, it's not, that's not something I, I've thought a lot about. I mean, just to follow up on what JP said, like it, some of this is obvious because it's constitutional, there are constitutional and legal requirements. Like you can't get around them. Um, so, so you have to face, you know, the things you have to face, you have to face. Things you have to deal with, you have to deal with. Um, and, and, and there are things that can't get done. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether you're trying to do an energy transition or you're trying to continue with aspects of the oil and gas industry, difficult to do without sort of dealing with indigenous and legal and constitutional facts. So Rachel, how, do, uh, how, how does the political world deal with the I in ESG? Well, I want to start by answering the same question you asked the other okay. two, because I have a factoid that I yeah. think uh, is good to just to contribute to, I think, uh, where GP was heading. But I mean, indigenous communities right now today are the third largest asset holders in Canada of clean energy infrastructure. So there are massive leadership happening across the country, it, led by indigenous communities on renewable energy projects. And, you know, of I think lifting that up as a source of leadership and recognizing like the incredible um, things that we can learn from where communities have gone and where they've headed and th that sustainability is number one. That's a narrative not enough people are talking about is that leadership and where is the kind of funding that other entities can provide to help like leverage and capitalize on that leadership. Um, second, you know, to the point around, I think I referenced earlier, you know, we're going to need critical minerals for the transition, the massive amounts of transmission infrastructure. These are opportunities. And you know, looking at them not only as the, the challenges around regulatory timelines or you know, our historic inability to work in a uh, respectful, collaborative, and uh, parity model with indigenous communities, but that kind of build out will bring economic opportunities to regions of the country that I think there, there is a lot of opportunity there for an indigenous workforce, for indigenous communities, but it has to start from the parity that JP is talking about and, and really recognizing, you know, of course, all people when we're talking about partnerships and we're talking about politics, like, you know, there needs to be a benefit involved for people to kind of get on board. So uh, that's a great segue to the question I presaged a little bit earlier, uh, which are the strengths. And before we get to the weaknesses, which is the next question, what are the strengths that we have in Canada for collaboration? Rachel. Whew. Strengths. Um, I mean, I think, uh, 
We are sitting in an exciting moment just globally, and we've talked about Canada as a small open economy. We're seeing massive change south of the border in terms of shifting the economic model, and our economy has always been a little dependent on those interactive supply chains and value chains. So, you know, I think that there's some exciting new possibilities just in terms of how we can um, ex explore how that changes the dynamics of our own partnerships and politics. Um, I think some of the model around industrial policy and the big investments that went in through the US, but also in Europe and other places are really built on new understandings about how the private sector and public sector could interact and how do you kind of work collaboratively to figure out, like we have a, want to do a massive ch economic transition, massive energy transition. We need to figure out kind of step by step in an iterative process how to get there together. So some real potential and possibility there. And Canada, you know, is economically well positioned. We have an already much cleaner electricity grid. We've got an educated workforce. We've got, you know, critical minerals. Like there's lots of things that make it a real economic possibility here for this to actually come out in a positive way. Um, so again, that I think opens up some new possibilities for partnerships and positive politics. But um, you know, happy to talk about the flip side as well. But I, I see Welcome. reasons for optimism. Uh, Tony, do you want to address the strengths, and we'll hit weaknesses in a minute? Yeah. So I mean, the strength is so far we have had a somewhat less polarized political environment than the United States. We've historically had that. Is that going to endure? That is an interesting question. I mean, we have. A long history of, so here's, here's the negative, we have a long history of regional tensions and regional disagreements and, we, and we, that is underlined by the fact that, let's face it, our oil and gas industry is located in some places and not located in other places and that has resulted in some rather large um, political differences in the outlooks of, of, of some of those voters and, and you know, and JP kind of underlined one of them that we don't talk about, that it's not, there's not, it's not just an Alberta, not Alberta difference. It can be a sort of rural indigenous versus not rest of Canada difference in some of these things in, in, in terms of employment, benefits of the oil and gas industry and all that. So I, I think those tensions are going to be significant. That said, I kind of do feel like we are sort of stumbling in the right direction on all of this. Uh, I, we, I want to end optimistically, so don't peek yeah, too early. Yeah. Uh, JP, <laughs> go, go ahead with strengths. Well, incredibly endowed country when it comes to natural resources. We were talking earlier, unfortunately, I'll just dip into the negative. We're really good at skewing trees and drawing water. We've got to get better at um, the, other, the other aspects of manufacturing and value add. I think um, that other people from around the world want to move here for a whole plethora of reasons. And our immigration policy, we're, I don't know what the numbers are, but there are, like, there are hundreds of thousands of people coming in now every year. 100, 150, I think we're, it was. We, we got 1 million, million last year. Well, yeah. Yeah. We immigration plus. Immigration. We got I mean, record last year. Immigration in, plus non-permanent, 1 million. And, and why do they want to come here? Um, because of the snow and the ice and the bugs? <laughs> um, no, they come here because of uh, gender equality. It's not perfect, it's getting better. Indigenous issues are being addressed. Uh, we are, and this is a double-edged sword, we are an over-regulatory country, provincially, federally, but I mean, that's a good thing in many ways because it means we've got to take the time to do stuff right, but the problem is we move at the pace of a snail, we're never getting anything done. Um, and um, I think our Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah. <laughs> and the common dislike of them. <laughs> common and, and Mel, if I could just underline one thing, just so to be additionally, to attempt to be a little bit provocative, one of the strengths of Canada, whether we like it or not, is to, you know, JP's point about vast natural resources. Look, we sit on one of the world's uh, largest re supplies of oil, one of the world's largest supplies of natural gas. And that is actually a major political tension in this country because we are benefiting from it and we are also trying to figure out how to stop benefiting from it. That's attention. And we have, I wanted the strength to come out, one of the greatest uh, uh, hydro resources in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, by the way, doesn't take fossil fuels. Uh, so, all right, now that we're happy, let's get sad. Uh, Tony, <laughs> tell me about the weaknesses we have and try to do that without mentioning federal, provincial, and territorial relations. Um, 
No, you go ahead. You can see. You can raise it. No, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm trying to think through what what it, what it is that I should I should say about all this. Um, well, okay, d d just to pick up on what I was talking about a moment ago, and I, I think I, I really do think this is significant. We we have a real challenge of of trying to figure out how are we going to. So if you're if you're a European country that produces no oil or natural gas, it is a lot easier to talk about. Um, energy transition than it is for Canada. That's, that's just just sort of an economic fact. This, that's why eco fiscal exists because it's you know kind of a challenge for us to do this. We are closer to being Saudi Arabia than we are to being um, you know Belgium. Belgium. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's just a fact. Uh, so I think that's you know again I think that that's a, a major challenge for us in a way it, it is not for. A number of other countries. So JP, let me push on the indigenous uh, point as a weakness mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, the feds have to deal with the provinces, the provinces have to deal with each other and the feds, and everybody has to deal with First Nations. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of NGOs out there, and they all have different views, and there's no consensus in the country. How do you deal with this? Well, how do you build consensus? Where's the, how do you deal with these weaknesses? You know, building up a little bit more of the storyline behind that, you know, when we think about electrification in this country, there's a reason that all the electrification lines go north-south, right? And it's, again, it's provincial uh, and not the ability. And I used to sit on the board of Ontario Power Generation, and it baffled me sometimes that we um, give away our energy to the states. Um, Quebec is a major hydro um, um, superpower here in Canada, and their energy cheap, like one cent per kilowatt hour sometimes, or free goes to the states, but we're having major um, challenges getting our oil and gas assets down uh, to uh, reduce the energy required to extract um, the oil from the bitumen. Um, so I believe, you know, and again, there's only 633 First Nations, uh, there's 80,000 Inuit in the north, three different economic areas, uh, and the Métis representing about 5% of the population. We all think the same, as I've mentioned. Um, <laughs> I, but I think that there's a real opportunity. I'm just going to dip into the positivity again here, if you'll allow it for me. Uh, I think our, our, our biggest opportunity is empowering the Indigenous voice uh, to lead energy transition in this country. And I think we'll start to see more uh, east-west transition uh, transmission lines as an example uh, but it is very difficult the conversations with indigenous communities because you got to imagine you've gone from a have-not society uh, pushed to the peripheral of society my father my grandmothers were both residential school survivors my father um, basically grew up in the bush if you didn't kill something you didn't eat and now I'm sitting here just getting back from Singapore so you look at look at the transition that our people are going through. it's only one generation in many cases we have no intergenerational wealth our education numbers are finally catching up but when you put us into a place of power we haven't had a lot of the history and the experience with power and that's going to take some time to figure out there's still a lot of dysfunction in our communities uh, just to push back a little bit, uh, I remember I, I told you the story of my first meeting with the uh, chiefs of the, of the Peace River, and uh, each of them had to tell me about how their ancestors signed the agreements with uh, Queen Victoria. So they had lots of power. Uh, they perhaps didn't manage it as well as, but, but those are really positive opportunities of uh, a new generation of leadership coming out of First Nations. In particular, well, indigenous peoples generally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're like the numbers are improving every year. Like our women are really amazing. Um, our women with master's degrees are making more than men with master's degrees. Um, our people are being thrust into leadership positions. I think sometimes to the detriment with not enough experience because it's the thing to do these days. Um, but certainly there's a lot of pressure on Indigenous leadership if you have an education or experience to be spread incredibly thin. Um, but it's an exciting time, um, but not without its challenges. Rachel, uh, bring us back to reality. Talk about the weaknesses, please. <laughs>
We said we'd bring a lot to talk about uh, the challenges of living in a federation. No, 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 please, we need that. But we live in a federation, and under our constitution, something like electricity systems are provincial, which means you are dealing with, like, not one entity, but 13. You're dealing with, you know, if you look at something like the Atlantic Loop, which, you know, everyone points to as, you know, this should be the easiest inter uh, kind of interregional transmission line to get off the ground. You know, just back to that, you know, what are the, what's the history behind each of these parties? What, what do they care about? What are they going to get out of this deal? You know, you're dealing with even historic uh, negotiations that predate, you know, certainly my awareness of them around how Hydro-Quebec got, you know, the better advantage of a deal many, many years ago. Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to be the exporters of power? Who's going to be the importers? This is going to be tough when you start looking at that. And there's a lot of... Um, desire usually for this kind of energy security not only to be national like how are we going to have this independence and non-reliance on the rest of the world as canada on energy which would really promote interregional transmission but provincially just you know i don't really want to be buying my power from next door are they you know are they going to be able to raise my bill and i can't do anything about it and i think that's a very real fear and very ingrained so i think um you know just us living in the the federation that we're in i think you know tony points out another really good point our economies are very very diverse and i think our our politics are very diverse and so when you look at even questions like how many canadians you know think we should be doing more about climate change versus how many canadians even think that climate change is a you know like man-made entity those numbers are going to be very very different across this country in ways that are kind of predictable um, but it is a real challenge to try to then drive centralized movement forward, figure out which level of government should be responsible for what. So, you know, can the federal government impose carbon pricing? Can they create a clean electricity regulation? You know, how do they provide enough incentives to provinces to be able to do that? I think, you know, albeit that maybe we don't deal with the same polarized politics as Bill south of the border, I think, you know, also, we were talking just before this, you know, it used to be potentially you could say this is a conservative approach to policy. Like it's market-based, it's carbon pricing, there are tools. This is a more liberal approach, it's a large government, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of those um, traditional lines are, are really not there in Canadian politics. And so how do we, uh, you know, create that depoliticized environment where we all agree about the, the outcome we're looking for when the, you know, the base that each of the political parties in Canada are trying to talk to is coming from an extremely different place. We're not talking about the same outcomes, different tools. We're talking about totally different outcomes, totally different belief systems. Um, and I think that that's a real challenge. And then you start getting into, you know, Indigenous communities, but also, you know, just a lot of inequality around how, you know, economic benefits will be distributed, whether they're going to follow traditional patterns or, you know, try to, um, impose some greater equality and equity, and I think that those are important conversations, but also a real challenge around, you know, it's like, are we just building this, or you know, are we figuring out how to do it right? Um, so I think there's there's a lot of challenges, but. All right, um, uh, that, I want to pick up on your point about politics. Uh, the, Chris did not admonish us not to talk about pricing pollution. So, uh, but he did this morning's uh, panel, the first panel. And on that panel, Paul Rochon very quickly raised political difficulties for charging for pollution. Um, I always thought, and this was the essence of our conversation earlier, that uh, it was very conservative to uh, have a carbon tax that you were going to use the market. You were going to have individual adaptation and that uh, it would be a general law of general application uh, and that that would actually appeal to conservatives. And then Pierre Polyev comes along and says, oh no, we'll get rid of the carbon tax. And then you have the liberal government putting in contracts for difference to uh, try to lock in. I mean, this. how do we deal with uh, this where the, the, the how has become a divisive measure uh, for uh, our politicians. Rachel. <laughs> I mean, the answer to that question remains to be determined, and I think some of it depends on, you know, I gave Texas as an example, like how 
does the view of people in you know areas that different political parties or political stripes might be relying on do those views change in canada alberta is a leader in renewable energy projects as well you know is that going to change the feeling on the ground about those projects remains to be determined um, but I think any, you know, as you say, pl carbon pricing has become very politicized and intentionally so in Canada. So, you know, can you, under any form of government, would it be possible to keep an industrial pricing mechanism because business is actually relatively supportive for the certainty and stability it brings? Um, is it possible for there to be an entirely different brand of, po you know, policies that would lead to a clean economy those that look like industrial policies and kind of supporting manufacturing has had a lot more traction in a jurisdiction like Ontario than you know something that would be a market-based or regulatory policy. Um, so finding some, you know, to me as someone who would like to see traction no matter what, finding some ways and some policies that fit with the brand of any stripe of government, to me, that's what I want. And so, you know, I think there's some hope there, but certainly, you know, a, a challenge to figure those pieces out. So, JP, as our token business person on this panel, uh, how do you deal with uh, the certainty or uncertainty that Rachel's described? Well, you know, we're talking, um, you know, the path, if you're familiar with the Pathways Alliance, there's our six oil and gas companies, 90% of the oil producers in Alberta are looking at carbon capture utilization system. There's poor space in the ground. We, we want to be able to uh, pump the carbon back into the ground. Um, as it utilizes all, all six companies and others that want to plug into this line, there'll be rents that'll come through. This is going to be work running through multiple municipalities, multiple indigenous territories. Uh, I don't even know what the price tag is going to be. Now, can you imagine, so we're all putting, I can tell you the CEOs meet every Friday. They work hard on this. There's very strong targets uh, that are set. Um, now, can you imagine if all of a sudden the carbon tax gets, you've got a, you've got a half um, baked project or you know, you're half pregnant and all of a sudden the whole system changes on you, that's not good for business. No, absolutely not. I mean, we're planning for, you know, the 170 uh, per ton. Um, you know, that's these, you know, companies, they bake into their long-term um, economics and their strategies and their, their business operations, these costs. Um, and, you know, when things change, that puts the models, to your earlier point, Tony, imperfect plans, imperfect data, all of a sudden you have the data totally shifting on you, it's very hard to, um, um, to create any certainty and, and, and that's not good for business. So Tony, as an analytic observer of politics, uh, how do you explain uh, the idea that a carbon tax is, uh, is bad for conservative politics? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, again, it's interesting that we're, we're at an eco-fiscal event because, of course, the great conservative through eco-fiscal who came out and said, I'm in favor of carbon pricing was Preston Manning. And uh, he sort of has had no successors in the sense that no other conservative sort of jumped on the bandwagon and said, yes, Preston Manning's absolutely right. We're all four square. In fact, I mean, he was on the advisory committee to the Ecofiscal. I know. That's what I'm saying. He was. It was through Ecofiscal that he came out and did that. And I remember the first time he did it, and I was I was absolutely stunned. And I thought it was a very very hopeful sign. And it, you know, again, it's it's sort of it, it's an event that had no children. It, it, it's quite it's quite unfortunate. Look, I think that the 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 you know one of these many sort of dividing lines or areas of, of irrationality that I was talking about before, where people get, get fixated on something and they get they brand it a certain way, they go on gut. Uh, I think in this area, it's that um, there's a group of people in Canada, and a certain number of voters who, uh, and, and at least one political party, and they just don't, they are just opposed to taxes. They don't want to pay, but they're not opposed to paying indirectly in ways that they can't see. Um, that is one of the challenges, and, and I think that's what you're seeing with Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, is essentially the, the politically possible 
is backdoor subsidies involving hundreds of billions of dollars, which are still taxpayer money, even, even into the trillions, it's taxpayer money, but you didn't, you didn't pay when you went to the store, you didn't pay at the gas pump, so you don't feel like it. And you know, again, you, you spent years in, in government, uh, you remember the battles over the GST. The GST is sort of a classic example of that, where it's like people weren't as bothered by a hidden tax, but as soon as you made them have to know about it, uh, they became absolutely furious. Um, because so, it replaced the distorting manufacturer's sales tax. We replaced a hidden distorting tax with a less distorting visible tax, and people went apeshit. Um, <laughs> That's so a technical term, by the that way. That is the technical mean? economic term you will learn in uh, advanced microeconomics, yes. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let's shift gears a bit. I, I want to pick up on... Uh, we're here at a university, a distinguished university, probably the second best in Canada as I come from the University of Toronto. Uh, but what are the roles of NGOs and academics in promoting a rational debate? Do you want to start off, Rachel? You're, you're with a think tank. Come on. I'm with a think tank. And I have three degrees from McGill, just for the record. Ooh. So. <laughs> oh. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, I think... Um, I think you used more water. Yeah. <laughs> you paid for it. I did. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, um, going back to my former hat a little bit, you know, politics requires validators. And so one of the roles, I think, of you know, nonpartisan organizations who are truly studying these things is to try to get, into the, get under the hood, really understand the policy, understand whether it's well done, and be able to either say, yes, this is good, or no, it is bad, and help people. You know, not a lot of people trust government. You may be surprised to hear. So you know, you're Shocking. looking for, if you look on the spectrum of things that people trust, you know, your family doctor is probably still higher than you know, a think tank, but at least someone who's taken the time to reflect, really look into it, and help provide the public with a bit of a sense around you know, if people don't have the time in their day-to-day -day lives to be reading you know, the 90 pages of the Canada Gazette, like, what is the government doing and is it enough and is it going to do what we need it to do? Um, I think also creating um, like bridges and one of the things that our organization does uh, is really thinking through who are the right players to get in a room to help unlock this problem. So, you know, if you're thinking of along a supply chain or you're thinking a particular sector that we need to decarbonize, like having a bit of a convening power and helping again because you have the time and hopefully the ability to kind of think through some of these things, you know, how do we hear all these different actors and what they need and come forward with some actual policy solutions and recommendations that could be put to government? Um, so I think those are a couple of important roles. I mean, one thing I think is really interesting around clean economy, the energy transition, we're talking about who believes we can do something by 2030, who believes we can do something by 2050. Both of those things are beyond like a political cycle. They're beyond, you know, like my ability to foresee actual truth, you need to have evidence and experts and the media to translate it. Like, you know, in order to have a sense of like, are we on the right track? That's not something you can see or feel or touch. You need some of those external bodies to help give that sense about like, are we gonna get there? Are we on the right track? So I think that's an important role and one that does have some intersection with politics, but I won't speak more, I'll let my, Colleagues speak. JP, uh, uh, you mentioned pathways. I don't think of that as a, an, an NGO. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, but get, what, how does business view uh, the role of NGOs in the academy? Well, on the just picking up quickly though on on the when we get there, everybody's going to throw out a number on what there is. It's more about the pieces that are going to, the steps, the rungs and the ladder that's going to advance us rather than setting targets because the federal government will set some targets, the province, and you see what's going on in Alberta and, and, and was talked about this morning, and the feds, um, and then you have Pemina, then you've got think tanks, and everybody's throwing out numbers, and then you've got business who actually have the data and have the technology and have the, the monitoring and, and really have a strong sense of what the art of the possible it is, possible is, and what how much investment is going to take to get us advanced even further. Um, so there's all you know. 
agreeing on what there is always going to be a challenge, but I think the, it's, it's the role of universities is to test, I think, to, to always be testing assumptions. Um, uh, Edelman report, the trust barometer, I think you probably, some of you pick up on that. Um, universities still are very highly trusted, but those numbers are even coming down. Uh, and folks are trusting their neighbors, and their neighbors get their media from TikTok. Mm. I, I don't have TikTok. Do you have TikTok? <laughs> I don't have TikTok. Um, so, um, but on, on the on the on the um, NGOs, I used to work for an NGO. Yeah, I work for ENGOs. I still do work for ENGOs. Uh, the Canadian, uh, sorry, I used to work for the Canadian Boreal Initiative. Now the Indigenous um, Boreal Initiative, International Boreal Initiative, and uh, I chair a group of oil, gas, mining, forestry, finance, tourism um, organizations on what land back looks like, what um, what it, what uh, conservation economy looks like. So you know they still can play some really interesting. Um, placeholders for some diversity of thought and bring non-likely bedfellows together to have tough conversations if you get the right people in the room. And so I really cherish those opportunities. And But the problem is sometimes they get a little bit too overzealous and they start speaking for other groups like the Indigenous people. Please look up, um, I picked a fight with the Incredible Hulk. I did, uh, Ruffalo. Uh, I picked a fight with DiCaprio, I picked a fight with Fonda, and even our own Neil Young. If you look in the Toronto Star, sorry, uh, they picked it up. Um, I'm just teasing. You guys have printed some of my stuff in the past too, which I really appreciate. But it's, 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 it's seeing some of these ENGOs who purport to speak for us, and they don't even visit our communities, or they meet one Indigenous person, they think that they understand who we are, and you've got to be very careful for those ones, because I, I was in the Toronto Star, it, and like I really, really had fun with it, it you know. And 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 again, so you've got to really. Um, and going back to some of the earlier conversation, you really have to understand the narrative and call out the the BS. Um, um, so, but they do have an important role. So, Tony, I'll let you do three beyond just NGOs, the academy, and the media. Uh, what yeah. do you think? I I don't have any good great answers on that, other than to say, you know. Um, Look, I feel like I'm pumping Ecofiscal's tires here, but the truth is <laughs> Ecofiscal did have a significant impact on the political viability of carbon pricing. I, I think there's, you know, I can't prove that to you, but certainly having been there through the period of the last decade, it really seems to me that getting a message out there, a coherent message, a coherent analysis, uh, helped to make that possible. Um, we can other people can debate how much of a, an impact that in fact is having on our ability to get to lower and lower <laughs> carbon emissions but nevertheless it's you know we we got somewhere that the united states has not gotten to and, yeah. and is unable to get to, so so um talking about both um politics and partnerships uh the one group we haven't talked about yet are municipalities and um uh in some respects in the U.S. when George W. Bush was president, municipalities in the U.S. kept on dealing with uh, climate change, uh, even when the federal government uh, uh, withdrew. And in Canada, a lot of the municipalities are making significant headway. How do you form a partnership with municipalities when the Constitution denies that they exist? <laughs> Tony, do you want to... Um... I, I, I do not have a good answer to that, except that I, that I, I enjoy the joke. You're right. That it, it, they're just creatures of the provinces, right. according to the Constitution, so you can't really even deal with these, these fictional entities if you're, the, if you're the federal government. At least you're not supposed to be able to. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to that. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's values-based. Um, you know, the previous panel was really wonderful, and we talked about human capital, and municipalities have all the great universities and the, the colleges and all the stuff that supports the development of human capital that's going to um, support the economy. Um, it's it's um, to becoming a, a really more, it's becoming an interesting um, 
with COVID that happened, you know, I don't know what the stats are now, but like a lot of our population from the rural areas into the big cities and now the cost of living, they're starting to go back out to the rural rural areas and then we're starting to get this divide of of the, what was, I can't remember this, I just saw a headline this morning, I scanned it really quickly, but you know, you have the water, well, the water polo players in the cities and then the, the, the wranglers in the, in, but it's creating, it's creating a real divide in politics in where people exist and it's creating more d divisive views. Um, but I think maybe the municipalities can be playing a, um, a stronger role in um, um, creating space for some deeper conversations. I'm, I'm not sure. Rachel? Um, I mean, I think there's examples, particularly of larger municipalities who have been you know, calling climate emergencies, been trying to do things on the ground. I think at the municipal level where you start figuring out, you know, what is going to be the economic costs of climate change? Like, you know, you're dealing about insurance companies, municipalities that are watching, you know, like neighborhoods of road that are close to water. So they're going to be on the front lines of watching what's happening. So I think having, you know, meaningful partnerships and dialogues with municipalities is really important. And I think, yeah, being creatures of the province, but also own elected governments, you know, there's less, you're not aligned with a political party, you can, you know, have some conversations that are outside of that structure. So I think there's a lot of excitement there. I actually just spent the week talking about um, pickup of medium and heavy duty, like zero emission vehicles and talking about how do you, you know, when you're dealing with a million different procurement departments and legal departments and different rules, like how do you try to deal with the complexity that comes with working with very small or well, not, not all, in all cases small, but not every municipality is the city of Toronto or Montreal, etc. Um, and how do you try to create ways for those municipalities to group together and be able to do things like procure together or develop, you know, building code rules together. You know, I think there's some creativity there, but, you know, a lot of potential and possibility. I feel like my, my role here is to be glass half full most of the time. <laughs> when we need it. Um, <laughs> JP, you talked about uh, uh, 2030 and 2050 being beyond the political cycle. And um, we have a situation where dealing with climate change, we've got costs in the short run, and benefits in the long run. And we have a concentration of costs on some places and some industries, some people, and we have the benefits highly dispersed. How do we build a consensus in a circumstance like that? And how do you rationalize short run, long run? It's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's take the, uh, let's take the nuclear as an example, a prime example of the capital outlay for nuclear is astronomical, but we know that it's clean energy. We, we have socialization um, issues with it and it's an emotional debate quite often. Um, I'm a big believer in nuclear, I'm a big believer in SMRs. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an emotional debate and I think it's, um, when we think about my original premise around having like strong indigenous voices around the table with that seven generational thinking, the ESG, I think often um, bringing those voices into circles and I've seen it happen. I'm, I'm on a number of tables where you have indigenous government, industry working together. And really interesting is that, interestingly, is that when you put indigenous and, and industry together, partnerships together, the ability of those two, that partnership to influence outcomes be, is very potent because it's very hard for the government. It's easy for the government to say no to industry. It's easy for the government to say no to to, to First Nations, um, but it's very difficult when industry and First Nations get together and approach more. Well, I was in the back room about Mark Little and I, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Suncor, and I went to the government to, to get them to think about their procurement spending and to think about 5%. Um, and so they, they couldn't deny, they would shut me down, but there is this big business leader in there from Suncor who, you know, they're spending $750 million a year in revenue on Indigenous entrepreneurs, so you can't disprove that. Um, so it's about, I think, monitoring, it's about having that seven generational thinking. I think it's, a, um, it's um, you know, the climate, climate anxiety around youth is really, it's real. Like, uh, we have kids or grandkids and you can see it in their faces. Those are the ones that we should be thinking about. And, and when you're, um, and I, I think what, um, 
often when we talk about Indigenous entrepreneurship, what separates Indigenous entrepreneurs typically from non-Indigenous entrepreneurs is just their tie to community and land. And that always transcends business decisions. And again, that's why I think Indigenous voices are so important at the table because we're going to go, okay, nuclear, it's going to be really expensive now, but the, we can see the, the intended benefits from it, from clean energy, um, and we're going to be just driving that. That's just, that's just the narrative in our communities. Unless you're around it, you don't see it as intensely as I do. Um, so that's going to be part of it. Tony, how do we deal with this short-run, long-run problem? Uh, yeah, simple, simple, simple question. Um, so easy to, to handle. Um, so I, I'm going to come back to uh, something Paul Rochon brought up in the very first panel, which is the need for some kind of environmental Bretton Woods framework that we've got. We can't just sort of have individual countries or a small group of countries who actually aren't that much of the world's pollution uh, or uh, emissions like US, some European countries and Canada doing this deal. We've got to get the rest of the world in so that we are doing something to suppress demand for carbon fuels and suppress carbon emissions. I think that has to be the, that has to be the long-term goal because, so again, as Canadians, we can do our part in our little box to suppress domestic demand, and I think we should be working as hard as we possibly can to do that, but we are also a very large producer of oil and gas. Um, and that is just a reality, and it is a substantial part of, of our economy and substantial area of wealth. And so to do, we, we, are, we have to do two very difficult, we have to do something very difficult. We have to actually encourage the rest of the world to buy less of our product. Um, uh, that, is, that is the only solution to this. Our, our, our efforts to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions absent uh, those actions being taken in most of the rest of the world is like uh, trying to drain a bathtub with a thimble and a bathtub that's being filled up with a very, very powerful tap. So, um, yeah. That's the, the one, I remember say. I said we disagree on some. This is the one thing that I think I'll disagree with Tony on. Oh, go. go. Um, is only like we should, the world should be buying more of their ethical oil and gas from us. I agree. No, I 100% yeah. agree with okay, you. Okay, okay, good. Well, I, I thought we were going to have to so go. Let, to me, let me push on this. I, yeah. that I wrote down pipeline uh, because I want to uh, uh, ask whether in the, you know, in the short run, in order to get to 2050 and have the, meet our targets and meet the world's targets, we happen to have clean coal in Canada. We have a lot of natural gas that isn't getting to market, uh, which would replace dirty coal elsewhere. Yep. Don't we need to build pipelines and get our fossil fuels to market? Either of you want to start? The you know, we're going to end with Rachel, who's going to give us the right answer. The, 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 Cedar, <laughs> the Cedar LNG project, I mean, Chief Councillor Crystal Smith has been pushing for this forever. First Nations want the pipelines, they own the pipelines, they want to develop more pipelines to get natural gas out to offset all that stuff. And it's indigenous led. It's, yep. it's, it's, yeah, we were chatting about this. Yep. What are you talking? Yeah. yeah, no, uh, what he said. Uh, we, I mean, no, I, I, it's, it's, look, I think this is a, like, like most issues of, of great import, it is complicated because I think as Canadians, it, we want to take maximum economic advantage because us merely stepping back will provide us with an economic disadvantage and will just mean it's the equivalent of OPEC cutting oil emissions or gas emissions and then so they can push up Saudi, Russian and other revenues and they end up benefiting and we don't benefit and, we don't, and we're not benefiting the world by doing it. So, but, at the, but at the same time, I will say we do want to try to push for international agreements that keep lowering emissions, Agreed. Agreed. which is actually going to harm our industry. So I think we, we, have a, a, an ultra, we have to have an altruistic objective, but we also have to have a realistic basis for that long-term altruistic goal. But you can't have like Biden cutting the keystone and then all of a sudden yes. turning around and going to the OPEC countries and saying, can you, we get some oil from you? Like your biggest trading partner exactly. with ethical oil and you cut off our yeah. pipeline and now look where we are with the Russian conflict. Exactly. Well, it makes no sense. Sorry. Rachel, last, uh, uh, I, I <laughs> Don't get me started about Keystone. Uh, so I'm going to disagree for fun here. Um, yes. So 
I mean, number one, yes, Canada is sitting on, is seventh in the world on currently unexploited or unexplored fossil fuel resources. So this is a live debate in Canada. And, you know, I think because the conversations about politics, people are guided by their gut. My personal view is we live in a closing window to ensure a sustainable future on our planet and trying to keep that as our North Star and guiding principle in how we make decisions and recognize, uh, you know, it's been termed carbon bombs and that's not, you know, terminology that I'm going to use, but if we were to exp um, open new oil and gas fields, the IEA has said it's inconsistent with a 1.5 degree pathway to be able to open new oil and gas fields. So moral piece aside, um, in terms of Canada's economy, I think people talked about, yeah, the debate really comes into where do we do what and when and how do we close things off, but you know, I think people who are examining what's the least cost transition, it's to do it orderly, it's to do it smoothly, and Canada, you know, there are decisions being made today, people who have alluded to Volkswagen, where the new economic supply chains are going to be located, and if Canada is not directing its attention and focus to figure out how do we invest in that, um, companies as well. How do we, you know, build towards what the future economy is rather than trying to kind of pull the last of this? Um, we're going to lose our opportunity. And the IEA also says by 2050, oil is going to be worth $30 a barrel. You know, that is not feasible for Canadian production abated to kind of come in at that dollar value. So, you know, we have, I think, a requirement as a relatively wealthy country to ensure we are producing, you know, abating any fossil fuel production we're doing, but avoiding stranded assets, channeling public investment towards those parts of the economy that are going to be emerging and going to take a big place. That's where public dollars should go. I don't think I'm promoting a production cap so much as we need to lower emissions and focus public investment on areas for the future economy. All right, I'm going to get the hook from this uh, young woman with the curly hair in the front <laughs> row if I don't uh, if I don't go to questions from the floor. So uh, please uh, save me and go to ask us questions. And as you go to the uh, to the mic. Let me ask the audience, I'm going to do a poll, I'm going to follow from uh, Dr. Booth's uh, opening, and uh, ask people here, how many people know what year Canada will go to zero internal combustion engines by regulation? We have one person who put his hand up, we have two, three, four. And just to be clear, do you mean ex in, in existence or s no, new sales? No, new, new sales. New sales. New sales. New sales. Yeah. Yeah, and, and somebody yelled out 2035. That scares me. It scares me because nobody else in the room, we had about seven or eight people. Uh, everybody should know that. Oh, oh, oh well, no. I assume we knew. Uh, but my only point is that uh, the transition is coming, folks. Uh, we better get ready for it. Let me take uh, question one and question two. Sure. Uh, thanks for uh, for an entertaining and colorful discussion. Um, I just want to stick with the kind of parent theme of the of the plenary, which was which was around partnerships. And so I'm going to pick on you a little bit, JP, if that's okay, because I've kind of got a, a, two two questions, if you will. And one is more in a transactional sense, and the other is more with a, with a longer term view for for planning. And the first one is around you know businesses and indigenous communities really working hard right now to carve out uh, a path forward and, and really unlock some potential in, in you know, decarbonization projects, but also you know, clean energy projects of the future, and in some cases, conventional projects. Um, we haven't talked about uh, capital and how capital is important for, for, for benefits for your community, so I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit of color to the group and, and explain where things are at vis-a-vis -vis access to risk capital and the types of opportunities that can unlock and why it's important for the transition. And then the second part is around, um, you know, uh, your your comments and the role that you do on a day-to-day -day basis to be at various board tables providing advice and counsel and perspective. I know that there's a lot of companies in Canada that would, would like to have more of you <laughs> at their table, but there's only one of you and you're probably on like, what, 35 boards or something like that? Um, in, given that we're in a place of, of academic thought, like how do, we, how do we develop and nurture this pipeline of Indigenous talent so that they can be more active uh, at the board at the board level in in Canadian companies, so your thoughts in those two areas would be great. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, on the first one, yeah, capital is 
cash is king capital is so incredibly important. Rachel talked about the third. I thought it was a little bit higher, but it's a third of all. But but well, but you're you third drunk. in Canada. In like Canada, provinces and after provinces and utilities. But it's incredible, right? Um, that that many um, asset or in, in, in control of indigenous communities, um, the different economic models about how they're in control, debt equity instrument or or um, ratios in 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 ownership, um, and the key to um, that I believe um, and many of us believe to getting consent to develop any kind of project in Canada, a big part of that is capital. Um, having equity to participate in projects. That is a form of consent. And it doesn't mean you're going to get you all the way there, but it is a form and it is a long way to getting to consent to develop projects. Uh, back to the original statement that I said um, that came from the conference last year, all passed a net zero run through traditional territories. Our humans, we're not going to let anything go by anymore unless we're equity holders in this project. Now, the problem is... Um, if you're a First Nation and you live on a reserve, you can't own your assets. Um, unless you have the First Nation Land Management, Land Management Act, which takes some of the regs out of the Indian Act, puts in the care and control of the community so you can do long-term leases to start to develop equity. But can you imagine, um, well, th this is a big reason why Indigenous people don't have intergenerational wealth, because we can't own things. Um, so we're now relying on other instruments to access capital, capital pools. The, let me just give one, the, you know, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank has a billion dollar fund, which is great, but it's very risk adverse. I mean, you got every duck in order before you can access their capital. Same thing with the backstop at the Aboriginal, the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Fund, or corporation has a billion dollar fund. But um, when you look at, say, that recent, it's a pipeline, the Enbridge uh, deal done last October, um, it's the biggest deal done to date now, um, where about one, I'm going to be rounding a bit, but $1.2 billion was raised by the communities of the backstop of the Alberta, Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Fund. 23 nations, including three Métis communities, were able to take about a 12% stake um, in that project. This is long-term capital. Now that'll start flowing to the community. Uh, RBC hedged with because there was certainty around the the there's 250 million dollar backstop, so there's certainty there. Now the challenge is that there's no construction risk, there was no deal risk because there was already rent being paid on the bitumen and the affluence going through the pipelines. Um, but it took leadership on part of Enbridge and the communities to come together to create. So capital is going to be absolutely fundamental to the success. We haven't unlocked how we're going to figure out because banks think a certain way when it comes to risk. There aren't big uh, equity pools that support indigenous uh, capital projects or even indigenous entrepreneurs. Um, so we've got a, a ways to go. On the indigenous rep board representation, um, uh, yeah, the, I've got some incredible colleagues the, that, that are going through the IC Institute for Corporate Directors. I sit on their board. We're developing more Indigenous content in the programs at ICD. There's more Indigenous leaders going through the ICD program. Up to two years ago, I was one of seven Indigenous people in this country on a publicly traded company. Um, so that number, I think, is approaching 20-ish now, 17 or 20. The numbers are growing. Um, but it's also in the allyship, the mentorship, um, making room for us at the boardroom tables. There's all those practices. But I think the most important thing in this relationship is having allies. Um, you know, like, with all due respect, like, I go to a lot of events, and if there's not an Indigenous person on the panel, Indigenous issues don't get spoken about. You should all be speaking about Indigenous issues when I'm not in the room. Right. Um, because that's crucially important, which I hope I'm making abundantly clear today. And if I haven't, then talk to me, then tell me to smarten up. Glad you, you got to do better, and I will. Um, but that allyship is really, really important. Uh, hope I answer your questions. Great. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi. Um, my question regards the importance of JP, you brushed up on this, and I, I would like to dive deeper into it, but what are the consequences of climate doomism, and how do we strike the delicate balance of raising awareness and initiative while also not um, so much so that it's climate alarmism and then that hinders action, causes depression and anxiety in youth, and then also creates a lot of political divide? It's. Um it's so negative that I just, we better just get out there and burn as much. No. Um, <laughs> who wants to take this on? T Tony, you want to start? 
Um, yeah, well, so it's interesting you raise this question. I, 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 it's not something I've thought a lot about, but I do think there is, there may be kind of a, a, a general, like you, you referenced youth. I think there may be sort of a generational divide, and I think there is, there are a fair number of, of young people who are understandably profoundly worried about this and should be. Um, at the same time, you know, we, it's going to sound terrible to say this, but we sort of have to put it in perspective in the sense that, first of all, this is, this is something slow moving. Second of all, it is something we as humans are capable of doing something about. Um, and to come back to point one, it is slow moving. This, this, is, this would make a very, very, very boring Hollywood movie um, because it is moving so slowly. And I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, but I think that's kind of in reference to your sense of sort of complete doomism, like tomorrow we're all going to die. That's, that's not actually how it's going to work. Uh, oh, no, no, you go ahead. Take <laughs> oh, I said I was going to take on the role of glass half full. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I think uh, the organization that I work with, one of the things we do is try to get out and talk to Canadians um, about the clean economy in a way that's going to be optimistic, that's going to be positive, that pulls those stories about what's going to happen. Like we talk about the $50 billion possibility of the battery supply chain. We put a report on, you know, not to dig into the expertise of the last panel, but you know, the jobs available in a transition to a clean economy and how you can actually have more energy jobs when you start looking at how the, the energy transition is going to happen. And I think um, trying to find those ways that it does feel manageable, but you know, there are success points. One in five vehicles sold in British Columbia last quarter was electric. Like that is like this, you know, when you look at the cost of wind and solar electricity, you know, even from something like a political flashpoint in the mid 2010s in Ontario, the price has come down like another 50% for the production of wind and solar since then. So it just, stuff is happening on a real timeline. As you said, like we've got, we've got a lot of the technology we need to get to 2030. We don't have all that we need to get to 2050, but it is possible and I think, giving people that sense about what are the incremental things that need to change, what do governments need to do, and building that kind of political will and cohesion people referenced before, just like getting the social license to kind of take some of these actions, but watch that it's not going to be linear. Like there will be, you know, pickups in ways that we can't predict. And I think that that's reason for optimism, but it's certainly not that it won't happen without hard work. So yeah, just building a perfect, great answer. Um, it is going to be a hockey stick. Like we're around issues all the time. Like I'm so blessed to be able to be across sectors and concrete. Like everybody is making strides. Like this is, even though it is a slow, boring Hollywood movie, I think there's going to be this inflection point where it does this. Um, and so it's about managing your to like so we're human beings. Um, we need to feel hope and do the things and that bring you hope. So so I sit on an oil and gas company board. I sit on mining company boards. I sat on a nuclear board, hydro board, like all these resources. Um, I do a lot of for, I'm a logger by training. My dad was a logger, my grandfather was a logger. Um, but I also chair the Canada's Forest Trust, which is an organization designed to meet the two, million tree, two billion tree initiative, working with communities, making sure that we reforest our lands. I'm the Boreal Leadership Champions. I chair that group of all these leaders talking about a conservation economy and protected areas and working with the Guardians program. So it's, a, it's like your portfolio, your RSP portfolio. Dabble a little bit in everything. I think you know that's really important because I see the hope in community and I also see the opportunity to make sure that Canada's um, ethical oil is going to make it to market until we make this transition. Um, so it's not, it gets very disheartening when I see people so polarized in their corners. I'll get beat up as an oil and gas guy, or we're going to beat up on environmentalists. Listen, environmentalists, I think, generally speaking, don't get up and go, how are we going to destroy jobs today? And I don't think oil and gas companies, I can tell you because I'm around the executives figuring, and their families, don't get up and go, how are we going to destroy the environment? It's like, you got to take a tempered approach to all this and just really think about your day-to-day -day impact that you're going to have. Let me tell you, I have a 19-year-old daughter. If you ever need a haircut, she's, she's at LaSalle College. She's, she cut my hair yesterday, <laughs> passed her exam. So, uh, yeah, I'm a proud dad. Um, 
but uh, you know, doing the things that you're passionate about, and 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 you know, that's 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 the really important so part. I, I live this. I teach a course called The Role of Government. I do a module on the environment and climate change. Two of the readings. I had three readings. Two of the readings I had on. Uh, did exactly what you feared, alarmism. Uh, one was damage control from the Canadian Climate Institute, and the other was the tip of the iceberg from the Canadian Climate Institute. I happen to be on the board of the Canadian Climate Institute. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the students complained, it was so negative. I mean, come on, isn't there more hope here? And there's a great thing we had at our last board meeting with uh, Chris Turner, who uh, has he's a Canadian who's written this book called How to Be a Climate Optimist. Uh, and you don't want to be a climate optimist to the point where you don't take action, and you don't want to be a climate pessimist to the point where you don't take action. So it's a very fine balance. Um, Alex, and then over here. I'm going to keep on the don't alarmist. We know that the IPCC says that we have to reduce consumption of coal, coal, oil, and gas between 45 and 95 percent to reach net zero by 2050. We have an oil and gas sector that has just come out of a very profitable year. I think it's $29 billion collectively. And to bring politics into this, we have a potential governing party, soon to be probably, maybe I'm being too uh, if we read the tea leaves, who is, and they never mention the words climate change. So my question to the panel is, how can industry, although they seem, I mean, I heard the CEO of Sonova say that he needs more money from the feds and Alberta on Wednesday, that um, that's hard to hear when you know how much money they are making, but at the same time, I'm looking to industry to lead, I think, especially when a government comes in that isn't talking about climate. So how, how, what role is there for industry in moving us towards 2030, even though they say they can't meet the target? Or 2050, rather. I, I, I will start, but I want to hear from you guys. But I, I, I am struck by, uh, this is going back to a Rachel Notley experience in Alberta, uh, and this isn't a political comment, but when she came out with her climate plan, she had industry guys behind her. It was Steve Williams from Suncor who, was, uh, who gave her credibility. And so there's industry doing a lot. I think we need to put us in perspective. <laughs> it was a long time ago, I agree. Back, anyone else? Well, let me just yeah, jump in quickly. I, I, look, I think ultimately, government does have to lead. Whenever you're dealing with a collective action problem, you need a, you need a central rulemaking body at the national level. And I think we also need some central rulemaking at the international multinational level, because otherwise everyone is incentivized to try to be the free rider problem. If you sort of say to everybody, well, we're not going to put any speed limits on the road, but you, I encourage you to drive 23 kilometers an hour. Well, some people are going to do that. And a whole lot of other people are going to say, great, I can, I can speed ahead. So I think, I think this is, this is a kind of classic collective action problem where yeah, business has to, business will not be incentivized to do things absent some kind of collective incentives to do things. JP? Yeah, I mean, for sure, it's been a very uh, lucrative last couple of years, for sure. But there's the industry has certainly struggled uh, prior. It's cyclical. There is we we don't talk about the times when our industry has really suffered and we've had to let people off. We never bring that up. It's 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 when the industry does well. And I can tell you the the asset out the uh, the capital allocation to assets, things like pathways, things like hydrogen, things like wind. Um, renewables, like those are the things that the companies are are investing in. Um, the, we need, we absolutely, I agree with you, Tony, we do need to have government intervention. Um, we need to make sure that targets are set. We need to make sure that regulatory processes are there to keep the, the, the oil and gas companies, energy producers in check for sure. Um, we can't keep switching targets though. And I think that's yeah. part of the challenge. We can't keep switching policies because industry will follow and, in, and communities also want industry to follow certain environmental standards and regulations. But we can't be wishy-washy on where, where we're going to set targets one day and then uh, on another. I think that, that just adds to the uncertainty. Um, but certainly it's a cyclical nature of, of, of the energy sector. I mean, you know, I think 
there's a lot of work happening on net zero trajectories in all kinds of industry. And, you know, I've talked a lot about these new economic opportunities and, you know, companies like Lifecycle got brought up this morning. Um, so when we're looking at like what are the economic possibilities being created by the clean economy, there is industrial players looking to fill those. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. I would, however, totally agree with the idea that business at the end of the day, there's going to be some competitive advantage in some industries for clean production. But the more that kind of regulatory guardrails can be put on, the more we can actually have kind of just don't uh, put domestic industries at disadvantage because we have a global consensus on the kind of, you know, emissions intensity of steel and cement and other things that might be trade exposed, more steel. Um, you know, the more helpful that's going to be to create the parameters uh, around which industry can be progressive. But I'm just going to stop repeating myself and saying I have reason to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we need that. We have three questions in 10 minutes. So I'm going to uh, start over here, take all three questions, and then we'll uh, go back to the panel. Great. Thank you for the panel. I have a quick question, actually. We need mass mobilization for the energy transition, industrial, social, and so on. I'm not sure that what is politically feasible lies at the congruence of least cost or just transition. And so I'd like your thoughts on how we can trade off between those two to make something that's politically feasible. Thank you. Trade offs for uh, political feasibility. Yes, sir. Uh, again, someone asked a question that's really relevant to mine first. but. Would you say investing in ESG and clean economy today gives private investors superior or at least equivalent returns? Does, does this message that green is profitable need more spotlighting or more caveats? Thank, Thank you. you. Next. <laughs> Governments across Canada or North America launched their infrastructure plans over the last year. The new projects are in the planning phase and will go into procurement over the next two years and it's looking like a bidder's market. What role will the partnerships you guys discussed today play over the next 24 months to ensure we're closer to our target for 2030? Thank you. So we have uh, trade-offs on political feasibility, ESG and the returns, which is an empirical question, but we can comment on it, and infrastructure. How do we prepare for climate change in this upcoming infrastructure um, a wave of investment. By the way, there are more cranes, construction cranes in Toronto, this is not necessarily a boast or a good thing, uh, than, than there are any other in any other city in North America. And it's been that and, way for, uh, years. for years. It's been that way for years. For years. And so this is a huge growth, and like I say, it's not necessarily a good thing. Anyway, um, who wants to take on political feasibility, ESG returns, or infrastructure? JP, simple questions. Well, maybe I'll jump into the uh, to the ESG question because I'm I, I again I was bashing it earlier. Um, I listen. Shareholders are you. Where you put your money is going. And money is going to influence um, outcomes, and your demands um, on the BlackRock, what the Black Rocks in the world are doing. Um, you know they did retract. <laughs> uh, RBC is getting hit now. They've been retracted. Um, and it, it, I think the biggest challenge is that we, we, we get blown in the wind so much depending on what's happening. Oh, now we've got a Russian conflict. Um, but, I, but I think overall ESG is going to help save the day. I think um, because our kids are demanding way more from us than, than, than we demanded from our parents. The, the younger generation is way smarter than, uh, than, than we are with our parents. Um, and I think... Um, it's just going, you're going to put your money where, 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 where it needs to go. And I think that's free market. And I think that's really important. On the, um, on the second question, there's a qu sort of on the environment, the green projects. We have to, we have to spend more on technology. We have to spend more on the hydrogen. We have to spend more on electrification. We've got to spend more on small modular reactor. All these things that are going to help us get the energy mix to, um, to get to. So yes, absolutely. Um, we, we've got to do it. Uh, it's got to make feasible, fe like economic sense as well. But our policies have to align with that. Um, you know, as an example, did you know uh, in, in, in Ontario Hydro System, um, the so at OPG, um, our f hydro facilities, if the wind started blowing up, blowing, or the sun shone, 
then we would have to stop the, hydro the water flow, which is the lowest energy production there is, like three, four cents a kilowatt, to make room for 60 to 80 percent, or six, yeah, 60 to 80 cents per kilowatt, um, which makes no sense. And by the way, even if we had to spill over the gates, um, we would still have to charge the ratepayers the money that goes over the water to make room for the high, for the wind and the and 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 the sun. So our policies have to align to to make sure that we've got um, real market uh, uh, indicators and and triggers to the way that we behave with our energy consumption. Uh, I think that's going to help us get us there. Tony. Um. I'll, I'll try to pick up on the on the first question, uh, you know, sort of the political feasibility, economic feasibility. Uh, uh, I probably should have dropped this, you know, the, this provocative idea in earlier on, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out here now. Uh, look, I, I think, you know, and Rachel and I were talking about it earlier, um, and Chris and I have been talking about it. And, and look, I think, you know, Canada's model for me should be Norway. Uh, Norway is a highly social democratic country with a uh, higher standard of living in Canada, much more extensive social programs, much higher taxes, way less inequality. Um, it's also basically Alberta in the sense that it's got around 5 million people and produces a lot of oil and gas. And it is showing no interest in reducing the amount of oil and gas it produces. In fact, it's trying to increase the amount of oil and gas it produces, while at the same time dramatically reducing its domestic uh, uh, consumption of fossil fuels. So it is essentially saying we, we're going to work very hard, harder than most countries, on the things that we can actually control, which is our own domestic uh, carbon emissions. But we can't control, we're Norway, we can't control the rest of the world's carbon demand, just like Canada at sort of one point something percent of the world's carbon emissions. We're we're a drop in the bucket, but we should try to do everything we can on that. But we cannot control global um, carbon demand. So uh, I would suggest that we, you know, we pursue the Norway model. I happen to think that would be politically, that would actually bridge some political gaps. Uh, I, I think we're going to have otherwise real challenges bridging the political gaps while doing so in a way that does not economically harm ourselves. So I want to give Rachel the last yeah, word yeah. because last I know word. that she's going to be yeah. positive. Uh, so, but let me intervene on, just on the last two. Um, on being Norway, I think it's an interesting uh, challenge, but uh, Norway is a unitary state and, yes. and everybody shares in the same way. Yep. The problem with Canada are those pesky provinces, unfortunately. Yep. And if we were only a unitary, no, all right, never mind. Um, <laughs> If only on, the oil were equally distributed across the whole country. Exactly, yeah. or, or, or water for uh, hydro, uh, or SMRs. Yeah. Um, on on uh, JP's point about uh, ESG, uh, the only qualification I put to it is that most of that money is coming out of pension funds. And so, yes, everybody in this room, whether they know it or not, is an investor in those uh, assets and uh, partly through the CPPIB, uh, but uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, to uh, sensitize CPPIB, the Caisse de Depot, the Plasma, and other pension funds uh, in that regard. And the last thing on the infrastructure, I'll just add, uh, I uh, used to be the chair of the board of Canadian Blood Services, and we had, um, uh, we built a new facility in Calgary, largest blood facility, second largest blood facility in the world, and uh, we made it lead. And uh, we couldn't get to platinum because of the uh, transportation system in Calgary, uh, but we were gold. And it, all of that infrastructure had environment as a driving uh, force in it. Last word, Rachel. Well, I won't touch the Norway thing because I've already made my pitch, I think, mm -hmm. on uh, supply side, you know, making sure that we're producing and globally how that would work. Maybe on the just transition versus kind of orderly, I mean, the unfortunate truth is I'm not sure you can have the political will without thinking about the labor and geographic and other implications of the transition. I don't know that you get I don't know that you can do one without another. So it is a nearly impossible task to think about equally prioritizing, but if we're not talking about equity stakes for Indigenous communities, we're not talking about what happens to Alberta and workers, um, you know, I, I think that things will fall apart and the cohesion we're looking for and the, the collective work we're looking for. So 
we have to be doing all things all at once everywhere. Um, and but I think sometimes the in, on the infrastructure plans very briefly. The, you know, you, you never know where those unlikely partnerships are going to come from. So just for example, Canadian, Canada is producing on average cleaner steel, cleaner cement, cleaner aluminum because of our electric grid. And so if we were trying to procure clean materials, that's actually going to assist in some ways to Canadian jobs, particularly if we can continue to decarbonize our own production. So looking for unlikely partnerships or unlikely ways that we can actually be creating co-benefits, that's how we're going to find the partnerships, that's how we're going to create the politics. Um, so we got to just go out and find those. Three o'clock, over to you. Hang on. Uh, Nearly so impossible task, Rachel just said. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we've got smart people that have been around the policy block or two or three or 15 times uh, to sort out the nearly impossible task. I would like to pose a question to the group that you can chat amongst yourselves over coffee on the Norway issue. So if we can't just be a unitary state, we can't just wave a magic wand and be a unitary state, and we can't just spread out the oil across all regions, let's just suppose that's not possible. Is there a case, this is to reduce political tensions, is there at least a case for our federal government to make sure that the policies that they design and implement are imposed in a more or less regionally neutral, industrially neutral way, rather than ones that might be perceived as picking on sectors or picking on regions. Would you say a just way? You know, I'm, it's, for me, it's just another policy idea. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just throw that out there. Um, so in about two minutes, we get to uh, go and have coffee and maybe something to eat, I'm not sure. But before we do that, I'm gonna draw four names from here to raffle off four books. So uh, Harshini gets to decide which is the first book. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's this. Which one is it, which one is it? Which one is it? It is Canada and Climate Change, quite a good book. I read that over Christmas. And it is uh, Alan Veloso, is that right? Yeah. Alan Veloso, there we go. Okay, next book is, uh, yes, okay. Uh, a faith-based approach to, not really, that's not quite the right description, but it's in the ballpark of faith-based approach to understanding climate change. Uh, wow. Julian, I'm going with Julian Bork. Is that right? Okay. Okay, number three is Tom Rand. Kick the fossil fuel habit, cool book. Don't just let it sit looking pretty on your coffee table. Um, Calvin Trottier Chi. And last but not least, Sheila Wakluche's book, The Right to Be Cold, John, John Buchan, as in the famous novelist, The 39 Steps. John Buchan, is this correct? Or is it, is it John Buchanan? Maybe it's John Buchanan. Is it? Yes, there's John Buchanan. Is there either a John Buchan or a John Buchanan present? Okay, so the rules of the game here are if the winner is not here, then they aren't the winner. So we move on to William Ward. There we go. All right. Um, so Mel Cap was bang on time. I took us two minutes late, which means you only get a 28 minute coffee break. So please help yourself to coffee and snacks and we'll back here, back here at 3.30. Thank you all very much. Rachel, JP, Tony, Mel, awesome. Man.